Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to one of our Caring Conversations uh, sponsored by the Amherst Senior Center. So this Caring Conversation is a series that we've designed to help people through a sort of a challenging time that we've come across with COVID and assisting us with planning and making sure that our wishes for our medical care, end of life, and just making sure that the people that matter to us know what our wishes are and that they are documented. So this pandemic has really focused our attention with the older adult community on this topic of preparing and planning and making sure that medical care decisions are in fact a set in place and that they're made known. So today's uh, special wonderful guest is Dr. Erin Salvador. Dr. Salvador is a palliative care doctor and she has agreed to help us walk through some of the challenging decisions that individuals face with regard to making sure that the people who matter to us most know what our wishes are and making sure that we document them. The prior conversation was with, um, with Dr. Rebecca Starr, and she had a, really made the great point of people have wishes, but they don't always document their wishes. And so this is gonna be an opportunity. It's gonna be interactive. So if you are listening or you are participating, make sure that you have a pen and paper with you because she's gonna walk us through how to have the hard conversations of making sure that the people who matter to us know what matters to us. So I wanna welcome Dr. Erin Salvador and I am going to um, shift her to being the host of this event. And um, here we go. So hopefully this will work out. It's always new with this technology. So thank you so much, Erin. And uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and if you would share your background. Yeah, sure. So thank you, Mary Beth. And, and thank you for having me here to be part of these conversations. It's, it's really my pleasure, pleasure and privilege to help people think about these things. Um, and thank you to the folks who have joined us this morning. Um, I do wanna let you know that it may sound a little intimidating that it's um, interactive and we're gonna talk about these things, but it's really gonna be just personal things that you're writing down on your own. So um, nothing that you'll have to share. So, so I am a palliative care uh, clinician. So let me tell you a little bit about myself personally first. Um, I grew up in Iowa. Um, and then um, now, after many, many moves and different things in my career, I live right here in Amherst in Echo Hill with my husband and my two teenage children. So, and we've really enjoyed being here. And it's such a unique and lovely community. And I think the, um, the wisdom and the spirit that comes with the um, older um, folks that are, live here is really a treasure for me and my family. Um, so uh, after Iowa, I moved to uh, Cambridge, Mass. I played basketball at Harvard and I studied on the side, I say. Um, and then <clears throat> medical school took me to Baltimore. Where I, was at, I went to Johns Hopkins Medical School and I met my husband, Doug, there. We got married a few weeks before graduation. Um, and then after medical school, you go on to do what's called a residency, which is lear learning in a hospital, mostly about the specialty that you're going to go into. So. Um, we moved to Rochester, New York, and I initially was a physician, an obstetrician gynecologist. Um, so I learned to deliver babies and all the things that go along with uh, women's care. Um, at the end of those four years, about a week before the, those ended, we had our first daughter, Ingrid, um, and then moved to the South Shore of Boston, where I began uh, my private practice, um, which was wonderful. I very much enjoyed my work. Um, and especially bringing new life, you know, there when new life started. Um, <clears throat> it, was, it was very much a privilege. And then um, when my kids were young um, and my second parent had died when I was 33, I decided, you know, I want to be home with my kids a little more and coach them and volunteer and things like that because my husband and I both had very busy jobs as physicians. So I actually stayed home with my children for about 10 years while they were growing. Mm -hmm. um, took us to from the South Shore to the coast of Maine, just south of Portland. And then about six years ago, we moved here. And once we got back here I, and they got settled in school, I said, it's time for me to go back into medicine. 
And when I decided to go back into medicine, <clears throat> I wasn't sure what specialty I would want to do. I had ruled out OBGYN because the lifestyle that goes along with that is not, <clears throat> you know, delivering babies was my passion. It <clears throat> doesn't leave a lot for other things. So I initially volunteered at Bay State Hospital on what's called an ACE unit, acute care for elderly. It's a specialized unit that Dr. Starr talked about. I don't know if you guys were, did you see that Dr. Starr's um, presentation as well. Um, so that's where I met um, Dr. Starr. And um, I started as a volunteer patient advocate to be with patients and families to make sure they understood things and to make sure they were understanding what care they were getting, etc. And after a couple of meetings where the palliative care team, and I can talk about what that means, had a meeting with the patient and their family members and their other doctors to sort of talk about what's really going on here, what decisions do we need to be making? How to best care for you? Um, I decided, wow, that's really what I want to do. So I've spent my time um, in that field since since then. Yeah. Oh, wow. So um, I take it that in terms of the care that you provide and the services that you provide in, with palliative care, that you are around a lot of families sometimes finding themselves in crisis, a medical crisis, and perhaps the discussion about medical care choices haven't, haven't uh, occurred. And I think that one of the, the important pieces around inviting people to this conversation is helping them to understand why it's important to have the conversation, which, which can be, I think, culturally challenging, or um, I think a lot of people resist having these conversations. So um, I always like to provide, here's the why of, of why we're doing this. So is there anything you could share, either anecdote or, or from the perspective of the, the medical provider or watching family members or even the person who might be struggling with a chronic illness or end of life, if they haven't had those conversations, what's sort of the drawback of not proceeding down that lane? Right. So um, I certainly in medicine and especially in palliative care <clears throat> have seen the perils and the suffering and the emotional toil things take on both patients and families um, who are nearing the end of life and needing to make critical decisions, who haven't had any conversation about what's really important, what's a quality of life for my mom that she would want or wouldn't want if, if I put her on a ventilator and she came off, but she'd have to be in a nursing home, would that be acceptable to her or not? Those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, one of my positions was actually working with patients and families who came into the hospital on the ACE unit who hadn't had these conversations and they were finding themselves in crisis. And <clears throat> what I find is that when you have these conversations, almost 100% almost of the time, people feel a lot better afterwards gives the patient a sense of power and control. Um, <clears throat> and it, the conversations really clarify what's important to them right till the end of their life, right? What's quality of life mean to them? Um, and thinking about what medical decisions that might mean in the future. Um, you know, just for instance, I remember one uh, family who, um, this patient was 96 years old and she was in for her like ninth hospitalization and in, in a very short period of time with different things going on. She was still like active and her mind was perfect and all of this. And I called her daughter in who was her healthcare proxy to talk. And then we talked for about an hour. And then the last few minutes, her other daughter got on from California. And we talked about, you know, really what was important to her and <clears throat> What, we, what I'm not sure everyone understands is that really the, what should happen is the root of the care you receive, both now and especially when decisions get really tough, should be coming from what matters to you, right? What you want your life to be now and if things happen. And um, if you don't have those conversations, um, you end up in crisis, the people, you may not understand what decisions need to be made. And also very often towards the end of life, we're not able to make our own decisions, whether our thinking is not clear or we're so sick, we're um, uh, you know, sleep too sleepy or too, in too much pain or whatnot. And we need to really rely on 
our healthcare proxies, which might be family, uh, loved ones, other important people in our life to talk to the doctors at that time and say what decisions to make. And I can tell you if conversations about what you would want <clears throat> um, haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, haven't happened, the, the person that's ha asked, being asked to make those decisions, is it's a very stressful position for them and they don't really know the right thing. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they have a lot of guilt um, afterwards, after dying, oftentimes, whether they made the quote right decision or not, they didn't know what the right decision was. So it really complicates their grief afterwards. Whereas when people have these conversations, it, it usually brings a closeness and a connections. It clarifies things. And, you know, we're all going to pass away sometime. And most of us won't pass away suddenly with a heart attack or in our sleep. So there's going to be time when we live with a serious illness and time when we make decisions about certain care. So um, if we've had this conversation, when the healthcare proxy needs to speak up, I literally say to them, if your mother was sitting here in this room with us during this meeting, what would she say about this decision? You know, so it takes it off of them and, and really says, brings your voice back into the picture. And that takes the burden off of them. And it also really helps us know what you would want. I definitely have seen some situations where patients and families suffer greatly from not having had these conversations ahead of time. Um, so I was just talking about the 96 year old patient just quickly in a one hour conversation with her and her daughter who was her healthcare proxy and the other daughter, we kind of had, you know, went through her life history and a story and that really told me what mattered to her and we talked about her medical situations and <clears throat> the doctor's job is to find out what's important to you because you're the expert on you. Make sure you, uh, we explain what the medical situation you're facing is and what it might look like ahead and how that might affect your life. And then putting those pieces together to really come up with a plan that helps you live your best days right till the very end. So these conversations are key to making that happen. And um, unfortunately, the way our medical system is set up now, um, oftentimes it's the patient or the family member who has to bring up to the doctor I really wanna talk about this ahead of time. It's not built into our medical system. So as much as lay people might say, well, my doctor's gonna ask me about that. We'll have that conversation when it's right. It's so not true. Um, we've looked at studies and more than half of the time, the patient brings up these conversations. And that's for various reasons, time, some doctors aren't comfortable with it, et cetera. But it's, it's your right and the way you're gonna feel that sense of power and control um, to have these conversations with important people in your life and positions. Yeah, wow, thank you so much. That, that really is a powerful reason to engage in this. I, I, I think that you, you really laid out a great uh, sort of synopsis for people to understand um, that it's not only about yourself, but it's in, in, it's also ends up being a gift to your family and it creates their sort of guilt about having to make hard choices if they should have to be in that position. And, and I found it so interesting when you talked about the way in which it complicates grief thereafter if that conversation hasn't been had. So uh, thank you. And, um, and that's one of the reasons I've so enjoyed speaking with you before this opportunity to share the conversation with others is... Um, you really have a, a wonderful way of wrapping around um, compassion and understanding people. And it, 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 when I speak with you, it's often uh, like you're putting together a puzzle of a person and their desire and how they live their life and how that should be reflected even as they age and the medical decisions that are made. So thank you. It's, it's a really wonderful uh, sharing for people. So given that we've, we've said like, come on, join us in this conversation. How do we begin this conversation of trying to figure out what's important? <clears throat> Is there, are there some steps that you could help us walk through to figure out what is important to me and then how do I share that? Yeah, so that's what we're gonna do today. And I know that the hour is a very short period of time, but what I'd like to do, um, anytime you're gonna to talk to someone else about what's important to you, you need to have thought about that first. And so in our society that often falls on the patient themselves to be proactive. I'm gonna give you a resource that you can go to that will walk you through the steps. 
ask you the questions, give you a little pamphlet about, okay, these are the questions you wanna think about. And then it walks you through, okay, who do you wanna to talk to? When do you wanna to talk to them? What do you wanna make sure you say? Um, but it really starts with what matters to you. Um, and especially when you're facing a serious illness. And then it, it will give you the steps to talk to your, your healthcare proxy, your physician, et cetera, and fill out any documents that would uh, show these, these preferences and goals that you would like. Um, but I really wanna get into that first part today of what matters to you. And I do wanna say that there are a lot of resources out there on the internet to help people go through these thought processes. I'm gonna use just one today and I'll point you right to where you can find it on the web. And um, it has really everything you need to get yourself going and to the point all the way toward, toward, toward the end of having everything lined up. Yeah. Great, okay. So you wanna take it away? <laughs> I thought you as a host, I, I've hopefully done the technology appropriately. So yeah. you can begin to walk people through or if there's anything you want to screen share um, in terms of helping people to understand what's important to them if they develop a serious illness or COVID or um, you know how how somebody should begin that conversation. Sure so I'm just going to give a little bit of background on sort of what we're talking about why we're talking about it we've touched on many of things already mm -hmm. um, you may also be asking what's a palliative care doctor and what do you do so palliative care is a field that specializes in, in, in focusing in, on patients that are going through a serious illness and their family members and providing an extra layer of support. It's a, it's a team, usually a palliative care team, social worker, physician, chaplain, an extra layer of support as you go through uh, that serious illness. You can see palliative care doctors. They can help you with symptom management if you're having a lot of pain or shortness of breath. Um, they can help you with conversations that really say, what is the quality of life we're looking for? And let's go down those paths. And it's important to know that it can, it's a specialty that can be part of your care. It doesn't take over your doctor's care, your specialist care. It, we work with them to coordinate. Um, when you're still going through any curative thing. So people sometimes ask, do I not, do I have to not be going through my cancer therapy or anything? No, palliative care is to be there along with you to provide extra support and expertise in managing those kinds of things. But today I'm not talking to you necessarily as a palliative care doctor. I'm talking just to you as someone who's had a lot of these conversations and trying to um, bring what you can do yourself to you. So I think, you know, just for a big picture, um, we've already talked about, you know, um, why having these conversations is important. Um, and then we also, I'm going to just quickly address the elephant in the room, which is COVID, right? Which we're all scared of and we're all living in, and I hate to say it, but we're not done with. Um, so a lot of times people think about these um, issues that we're going to talk about when they have a serious illness. Maybe they have end stage COPD or heart failure or cancer or dementia. But the, those serious illnesses usually last a while and you have some time. With COVID, unfortunately, you can get suddenly quite sick. So having conversations like this in anyone that's, you know, higher risk, you're older, you have medical conditions, to think about if COVID hits me, um, and I get seriously ill and need to be hospitalized, what are the things I'm gonna want, okay? So that's sort of the elephant in the room and why this is, it's not a conversation that we would have in the course of a long serious illness, but it's a proactive conversation about what would, what would I do and want um, if I did get COVID. Mm -hmm. um, can, I, can I just ask, because I, I know that some of your work has been COVID related, H has, um, because of the, rapid way in which it might progress. Has that sort of also brought a, an urgency to this discussion, to have the discussion while you're still well before it, you should happen to have a, a diagnosis or an exposure or, 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 you know, some kind of a risk? Yeah, exactly. So that's why um, this is a proactive discussion now, especially in people who are higher risk, because it can come on. You can develop COVID and have 
most people will have a mild to moderate illness. Um, you know, uh, maybe fevers, cough, um, headaches, sore throat, some nausea, you know, a combination of a number of symptoms, but can stay home and hydrate and rest and be well and support themselves there and get through it like other viruses. But we do know that there's a certain set of patients that um, instead of over, you know, a week or so getting better, that they actually get sicker. And sometimes that can happen quite suddenly. Often they might have symptoms for a few days, three, four, five days, and then start to develop trouble breathing. And um, when if you develop trouble breathing with COVID, it's time to call 911 because, um, and then people go to the hospital and sometimes very shortly after uh, you get to the hospital, you can be making some decisions about, I mean, they'll give you fluids and they'll give you oxygen, but um, if you're young and healthy, um, oftentimes, even if you need to be hospitalized, even if you need to have a ventilator, you're usually going to come off of that and go home. The concern is, is that if you're older, and we know that patients over 80 are at highest risk, or you have preconditions pre-existing conditions that make you higher risk, diabetes, high blood pressure, COPD, asthma, things like that, that there's a chance that you may need to go on a ventilator to breathe. And despite that, you may die on the ventilator. Or you may go on a ventilator to breathe. You may be on it for weeks. And we know there's the isolation factor too with COVID in the hospital. And even if you get off the ventilator, between long-term effects on your lungs and the, the difficulty of going through rehab and getting stronger, you may actually never get back to the quality of life that you think is acceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really important to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, I think we've scaffolded and scaffolded why this is important. Um, I just wanna go through the steps that you would take. And you know, the first one is showing up to something like this, which is awesome. I'm so glad you're here. Um, because the steps really are, you need to think about what matters most to you. You are the root of what medical decisions should be for your care. You have that. You need to decide who's going to speak for you if somebody needs to and you can't. So next week, Mary Beth and Anita are going to be doing a um, a session on healthcare proxies and that that is naming your healthcare proxy and documenting that. Um, and then you need to have the conversations with your healthcare proxies with other family or important people in your life so they know what you're thinking and with your doctors or advanced practitioners, et cetera. When I say doctors, I mean anybody that you go to for your primary care or your specialty care. And, um, and then you need to fill out any documents and again, healthcare proxy is like everyone over 18 should have a healthcare proxy. Mary Beth will talk about that. And then there's some documents if you've decided with your doctor, I, want, I don't want to have some life-sustaining treatments like a ventilator or which is a breathing tube or um, you know, CPR if I were to pass away, you, you document those in a medical order, which she'll also talk about next week. It's called a MOLST. So, um, let me, uh, I think I've talked about COVID a little bit. Um, you know, the most important thing just in talking about COVID, you guys probably all know this is, you know, the thing, the best thing you can do is take care of yourself and try not to get it. So I'm sure you're following all those preventive measures and I don't need to go over there. Like I said, most people develop a mild or moderate illness and don't need to be hospitalized and, and, and do just fine. Some go into the hospital, some need life support treatment, some come off of that life support treatment, some don't. And we really want to think about what it would mean for you if those situations came up. So what I want to do now is, um, hopefully I've laid the groundwork, I'm going to share my screen and this is when um, I'm going to have you answer a few questions and this is just to get you started on thinking about what matters to you. Um, and if you wouldn't mind to playing along with me, each having a piece of paper and a pen to just write down the answers to your questions, I'm not gonna ask you the answers and you'll keep that with you and you can do with it what you'd like. So 
I'm going to screen share and you guys just give me a thumbs up when you have your um, paper and pencil ready. Everybody's good? Okay, awesome. Thank you. So, uh, so the way this starts out, so the preface of all of these questions is, think about what you would want if you became seriously ill with COVID. So it says, like I've said, people who are older or have chronic medical conditions are more likely to become very sick if they get COVID-19. Some will recover with hospital care, but even with ventilator support, some will die. Think about what you would want if you became very sick at this time. So this is just a, this starting picture is about, um, I haven't asked you anything you need to write down yet, but this is just says, you know, good days start with good talk. You know, having these conversations is how you can ensure that good days are ahead. Um, and so you can live your best uh, life. So this is all from a document that I'm gonna point you to online. This is called Being Prepared in the Time of COVID, Three Things You Can Do Now. The first one, pick your healthcare decision maker. You're gonna to talk to Mary Beth about that next week. Talk about what matters most to you. But it's listed as number three, think about what you would want if you became seriously ill with COVID. We're gonna do that today. And then you can follow up with those other three um, on your own time. So the first question is, if you became seriously ill with COVID, what would be most important to you? So if you can just write down on your paper, most important, and then put some things that come to your mind and I'm gonna give you a couple minutes. Um, you know, they gave examples here, being comfortable or trying all possible treatments. Other things people might say is stay in my home, not suffer. Um, not go to a nursing home. Um, still be able to be around my loved ones. And you can take your time, but if you wanna just give me a thumbs up when, you, when you're done with that one, just let me know. Um, and also you can add more later, but take your time. Okay, awesome. So going on to the next question, what are you most worried about? So if you got COVID-19, what do you worry about could happen? They give examples here, being alone, being in pain, being a burden. But there are many others, being separated from family members, not being with my cat, the financial burden, the people I leave behind. What are you most worried about? So just write worried above this just so you know what your answers are in regards to. And just give a thumbs up whenever you're ready to go to the next question. 
but take your time. Great. Okay, next question. What is helping you through this difficult time? This is certainly a difficult time. And we all have things that bring us strength or support. Examples given, my friends, my faith, my cat. Could be exercise, meditation, the senior center. Mary Beth specifically. So just give a thumbs up if you're ready to move on. Take your time. Okay. Everybody doing all right so far? Okay. You're good students. If you became very sick with COVID-19, would you prefer to stay where you live or go to the hospital? So if you became very sick with COVID-19 and you, the decision came that you were so sick, you would either need to stay home or you would either need to go to the hospital and have more aggressive treatment or would you prefer to stay where you're at and focus on being there and bringing care to you um, that would provide you comfort and supportive care, but, it, but you may pass at home. Thumbs up, everybody, for a little more time. Okay. If you did choose to go to the hospital, would you re want to receive intensive care in the hospital? So you may have decided in the previous question, I would want to go into the hospital to get treatment to try to get me better from COVID. When you get to the hospital, there's a couple of choices. You can have as much treatment as they can give you, whether that be medicines should they develop that are very helpful, fluids um, and other things, but mostly it's supportive care and trying to support you to keep you hydrated and, and comfortable and give you some oxygen to help you with breathing. Would you want to do that and say, if I don't get better, let's focus on my comfort and maybe getting me home kind of thing? Or if you went to the hospital, would you say, 
if you were supporting me and my breathing got so bad that just regular oxygen through my nose or through a light mask didn't work. And the only way to continue to treat me, to keep me alive was to put me on a breathing machine, on a ventilator and go to the ICU, which includes, you know, being hooked up on monitors, having the breathing tube in, being sedated, um, is this something that you would want people to try? Or would you say, I wouldn't want to be going through that? Just to explain this question a little bit more. Okay. Only a few more. This is an extra box. List any other questions or concerns that you might want to bring up with your family, friend, healthcare provider, healthcare proxy when you talk to them. This could include anything, but certainly who would take care of my animals. Um, who would take care of, you know, there's some financial things that are outstanding I need to talk about. There's some people I want to talk to before I pass or some unfinished business I have. Or that something could help you when you got sick. Please call, you know, a, a rabbi or a priest or a, um, any other form of religious leader that's supportive for you, things like that. Make sure to bring me chocolate ice cream, things, you know, the important stuff. <laughs> that would be on my list. Thumbs up, ready to move on or need a little more time? Okay, great. So you've completed um, the questions I'm gonna ask you. So I'm hoping that none of those raised your blood pressure too much and that it was something that you, know, you were in control of and there was no uh, pressure um, because this is the root of where things start. Um, so I'm proud of you and thank you for going through that because it, it's not necessarily easy for people to do, but so important. So you've done number three, you've thought about what you'd want if you became seriously ill with COVID. Next week, um, you're going to, uh, Mary Beth and Anita are going to talk about picking the person to be your healthcare proxy or persons. You can put a couple, two or three. Um, which is often nice to have more than one so people can share the burden or not burden, but responsibility. And then um, you're gonna need to have conversations because it's nice that you wrote this stuff down, 
But if we write things down or we fill out a healthcare form or we make something with a doctor and we never share it with anybody, they don't have the information to act on it and to take the best care, advocate for the care you would want. So really important to have the conversation and then make sure you're documenting things in certain ways, which Mary Beth will go over in detail next week. So this is a resource. I'm sorry, some of it might be cut off because of all of our smiling faces this morning. But this is the one resource I would point you to. It's called the Conversation Project. And if you just type that into your browser, if you have one, or your phone, you'll come up to a, a page that looks a lot like what's on the left there. And it will take you everywhere you want to go and it will provide you supportive documents along the way to get you there. So if you went to this page, you see right there, there's a brand new guide specific to COVID-19. That's what, that's what we just went through those questions. But on the other side of it, there's information about COVID, some of which we talked about, as well as how to choose a healthcare proxy. And you can open up a link that shows you the guide on who should I choose, what would matter, and what should matter in someone that I would choose. And then it will also take you through a larger, what's called a conversation starter kit that asks you more in detail questions about what matters to you as you think about things, um, including how much say would I want in my medical care or would I want others to mostly speak for me? Where would I want to be? Um, what am I most worried about? Um, if I had to um, you know, balance between a little more pain but being awake and alert to meaningfully interact with people. How would I work with that? So this is, just go to this resource and it will take you through all of that. I will also have the resources, including this guide for COVID-19, a handout that talks about how to pick the healthcare proxy, the healthcare proxy forms, and those bigger starter kits um, printed out for the senior center. So if you need hard copies. And then those are things you take with you to have conversations. And like I said, in these books, it talks you through where do you wanna have the conversation? Who do you want it with, et cetera. And I forgot I had added on some extra credit questions. So before we just wrap up, I just wanted to go back to your paper and a few more extra credit questions. One is who, I, you may have a healthcare proxy already, but if you don't, I want you to write down who might I choose to be my healthcare proxy. You don't have to make the hard decision today or maybe it's an easy decision for you. But if you write down a couple people, some of us have more people we think of than others, but most of us, if we think hard enough, might have a family member, might have a neighbor, might have a religious leader that we can talk about what's important and we can trust that they will speak on our behalf. Everybody good with that one? The next extra credit. I have to use my glasses to see what I wrote here, sorry. Who should I talk about, talk to about my wishes and what's important to me? So this would include your healthcare proxy should be like the number one. This should include anybody else. And you might have that first conversation just with that one person or with that one person and your closest family member. But eventually anybody you think will be important when that when the time comes to really be thinking about you and caring about you, that you want, would want to be in on decision-making and supporting you is great to have. So for instance, if you have four kids and you get along with all of them, maybe only two of them are named as your healthcare proxy, but ideally you wanna sit down or in this time have your tablet there and have a video conversation or even just a phone conversation about these things to everyone. 
And it's also a good time to say, I've named so-and-so and so-and-so as the healthcare proxies because they're older, they're in the medical field, they were always my favorite, whatever. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, um, and to say, but I want all of you to help take care for me and make decisions for me at the end of your life. This really makes folks feel good. So the next one is, when would I want to have this conversation? And where would I want to have this conversation if I think about it? This is a little harder in COVID because of the um, difficulty with getting together. But like I said, there's video and audio abilities. And also if people are local, you can go into your backyard, stay, way more than six feet apart and have these conversations. But where would I want to do this? And when would I want to do this? Erin, can I ask a, a question about that from, from the opposite perspective of being an adult child of an older adult? Mm -hmm. um, do these conversations always have to be initiated by the older adult, or do you find uh, in your practice and experience that sometimes adult children might approach parents to say, you know, geez, mom or dad, um, you know, you're getting on in years, and we would really like to be a part of that process and help to generate that conversation if the older adult is resistant to having that conversation. So I just wanted to flip that script. Because um, there certainly will be some who will say, I'm in and I want to lead it, and others where it might be being led from, from adult kids. Yeah, so I think that's a great point, Mary Beth. And I think it starts with the fact that in our society, both in the medical arena and just in our personal lives, culturally, we don't have these conversations usually. So anybody who wants to start it is great. So if the patient themselves says, I'm going to be proactive, I want to tell people I want to start this, awesome. And you might be people like that because you're here and you're thinking about it. But, you know, if you were 30 years younger, you might be, you might have your parents alive and say, you know, I really want to know what's important to them. And I see that they're getting sicker or older, or I'm worried that they might get COVID. I want to bring this up. And so you can if you're one of those folks, you can use these same resources, the conversation project, which will help you talk to your family members about this. And, you know, it would be ideal if the doctors brought it up, but again, in our society, it's not like that. And I think some people who are trying to bring it up with maybe their older family member or, you know, their neighbor, if they're very close and it's really the two of them connected because they're worried, they may find, you may find resistance to begin with. This can often be a scary thing to talk about. And it's not talked about in our culture. You know, we have this culture that, oh, you know, we don't really think about death. It's not really going to happen and that sort of thing. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. but to say, um, so if you meet resistance, say, you know, I'm really coming from a lot, you know, make sure it's a loving standpoint. I really want to know about you and what's important. I want to make sure the rest of your days are good days. And I want to know how I can help. And I want to speak for you. And you know you best. So I want to hear that story and those things from you. It's also important to know that this isn't necessarily going to happen in one conversation. So you may bring it up that this is something I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could have coffee or talk over Zoom and just ask one question or something or give, you know, send them the resource in the mail to look over um, and they can fill out this little booklet. There's really just questions that you circle and then maybe the next phone call you talk about the first page or the next page. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's important to understand that it's very anxiety provoking for a lot of people and to come at it from a point of love and how you can help them best. And also it is important for people to know that it's helpful for you, that it's providing you some stress to know, not know what you would want. And it would be a relief and a privilege for them to know this so they could act and speak on your behalf and know that all your wishes right till the end are gonna be 
fulfilled, even if you're not able to speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. So those would be some things I would think about. Great. Thanks. Sure. Um, and then the last step is a section next steps. And if you can just list there the next steps you're going to take. So one might be do more work on this list. Go to Mary Beth's session. <laughs> Go on the web and look at these other resources. Call my healthcare proxies or loved ones or neighbors that are really important in my life and, and talk to them about this and get the conversation started. And another might be, I'm gonna give you my in contact information. So this is my email and my cell phone. And I live here in the community. And though I work at Bay State as a palliative care uh, clinician, and I work on the Mass Coalition for Serious Illness to come up with new initiatives. Um, and um, I work in teaching serious illness to people all over the country. One of the things that's important for me is to act locally and help people here. So I am gonna make myself always available for questions. And I'm actually available for, if you want to have this conversation with someone else, or you don't know where to go next, I'm happy to help, help guide you. And I'm actually happy to be there on the conversation through the video or whatnot. Not just, not acting as a doctor and giving you advice on what you should do or that, but to sort of mediate the discussion with you and your family members. Um, so please do reach out if I can help you. And that's all I have, Mary Beth. That is fantastic. So um, again, you can be reached, Dr. Aaron Salvador can be reached at aaronsalvador at me.com and her cell phone's 413-992-4132. Four one three two. If anybody uh, has any vision problems with any of the slides or the screen that's in front of you, and thank you so much for making yourself available to the community to assist in this endeavor. I have to say, from the moment I met you, you were so enthusiastic about this community conversation um, and the need for healthcare proxies to be documented and signed, and 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 a way in which wishes are shared and uh, conversations can unfold in a, in a way that's supported. And I love when you use that word scaffolding because I think that that's what you've done a beautiful job today of sharing is here's some scaffolding resources. So I just also wanna share with individuals if there's any follow-up, you can also contact us at the Amherst Senior Center. Um, our number is 259-3060. And the resources that uh, Dr. Salvador referenced, we will make sure that, that we make them available to you. We will mail them out to you. Or if you want to come and stop by, we meet people outside and we can hand documents uh, out to people. And we will be doing uh, more conversations around healthcare proxies and the medical order for life-sustaining treatment, which is also known as MOLST. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Salvador. You are a treasure in our community, and we are most grateful for your help, um, especially in this time of COVID, which, as you explained, has really laser focused our attention on the need to plan and to have these conversations in a way that's loving and compassionate. So thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for coming today and listening. And I hope I see you around town, and I hope you do take me up on contacting me and letting me help you if you find the need. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll end the recording and we look forward to having people a part of this conversation and continue to have good talks and making sure that people know what matters. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Salvador. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye now. <laughs>